welcome to the History of Psychology show. I'm your host, Christopher Green, from York University in Toronto, Canada. The aim of the show is to interview working and prominent historians of psychology, not only about their research, but also about their personal and professional backgrounds, and about their views of the field more widely. Critical thinking is one of those topics that you see everywhere in university these days. Everybody wants to advance the idea of critical thinking in their students, but very few people know where that idea came from or what purpose it was supposed to serve socially. Peter Lament of the University of Edinburgh, who is my guest today, published an article last year in the journal History of Psychology titled The Construction of Critical Thinking between how we think and what we believe. One of the really interesting things about this article is that within the year that it has been um, available online and, and in the journal, it has shot up to become the most downloaded article in the history of the journal, History of Psychology. That's been almost 25 years. So I'm really pleased to have Peter here today. Um, I hope you enjoy this interview. So Peter Lament, Welcome to the History of Psychology show. Thank you, Chris. It's lovely to be here. I'm glad to have you. Um, you've written this article, published this article recently, um, The Construction of Critical Thinking Between How We Think and What We Believe uh, in History of Psychology, uh, just uh, last year. And it is already the most downloaded article in the history of the journal. And it's a topic that I think lots of people are interested in. Um, Critical thinking is talked about everywhere in the academy these days, um, in the humanities, which are, of course, under attack from a number of different directions. Um, they argue that critical thinking is the primary product of getting uh, degrees in those, um, in those topics, in those disciplines like history and philosophy and uh, literary criticism. Um, in philosophy, critical thinking is often glossed as being equivalent to uh, being proficient in informal logic understanding validity, avoiding fallacies, and that sort of thing. Um, in the sciences, by contrast, critical thinking is often equated with expertise in scientific methods or even the scientific method. Um, and you hear that kind of talk in psychology a lot, but you also hear um, talk about Kahneman and Tversky style biases and heuristics like availability and representativeness. Um, but like all things, critical thinking has a history that most people don't know about, and you write about that history, um, where the phrase came from, what problems it was created to solve or address, um, how it has changed over the decades. Um, you say at the outset that critical thinking has been viewed alternatively as a trait, as an attitude, and as an ability. So um, could you start talking uh, about, in, in general terms, about the differences between these three visions of critical thinking? I'm, I'm not even sure uh, they'd be called visions, to be honest. But there are words that psychologists have used to refer to critical thinking. But, but just from what you were saying there, there's a, there's a bigger picture, as always. And, um, and part of that is that everybody thinks that critical thinking is a good thing. Uh, everyone thinks this. Uh, Christian fundamentalists think it's a good thing. Uh, they just think that critical thinking is something you do to refute challenges to the truth of the, of the, the Bible. So, so it's, it's come to mean uh, all things to all people. And as a result, like many other psychological concepts, it's been defined in all kinds of ways. And it, within psychology, there's been a few major themes. You mentioned um, before that philosophers tend to think of it as logical. Psychologists tend to think of it as scientific, scientific in the concept, in, in the context of psychology, of course, hypothesis testing, probability bias, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then as a, as a thing itself, in terms of what critical thinking is, it's been described as a character trait, as something that people have in, in different degrees. It's been um, particularly described as an ability, uh, again, something that people have, but which can be improved. Uh, that's crucial to the whole concept of critical thinking and can be displayed in a set of skills that can be taught and also as a, an attitude is something which is, is dispositional that some people are predisposed to um, to think in a certain way about certain things or certain people you know more or less critically and then individual psychologists have, have 
mix these up in different ways and that then determines the content of the measures that they use and the items that they have in their tests of critical thinking then follow in line with the kinds of assumptions they make about what precisely critical thinking is. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you think it's logic, uh, critical thinking is logical, then you have lots of tests of logical uh, reasoning. If you think it's attitudinal, if you think it's uh, scientific, then the items will reflect different things. Right, right. So, so let's get right into the history then. Um, you begin with uh, Goodwin Watson, a Columbia University psychologist who developed a test of what he called fair-mindedness in 1925. Um, what was Watson looking to accomplish? Um, I, well, I suppose at a personal level, he was a, a kind of progressive individual who saw psychology as, as a, a, a vehicle uh, of social change. He was doing this in the 1920s in the States when there was massive issues of prejudice of all kinds uh, surrounding him. And uh, he thought that the, the, the way to tackle prejudice was via education. And in order to do that, we need a reliable measure of critical thinking so we can see what kind of teaching works. So I think that would be the brief context. Um, in, in terms of what he did, he, he comes up with a measure and uses it to uh, test different kinds of teaching. Maybe we'll get back. I, I know you want to talk about IQ at some point, but maybe save that one till later. Okay. But, but, the, but, but the, the interesting thing about Goodwin uh, Watson is that he wants to get something to find out what sort of teaching will work, which will uh, effectively improve critical thinking. And to do that, uh, he comes up with a kind of measure of fair mind, what he calls fair mindedness, as something which is neutral. So he doesn't, although he believes himself that prejudice is bad, he does not assume in the concept itself that prejudice is necessarily bad. So he, he, he distances his own beliefs from the concept itself. And he actually explicitly says, there's no assumption here that prejudice is a bad thing. Right. In that so, case, he's been, sorry, go ahead. No, well, so, right. So you, you, you quote him saying, there is not an attempt here to insist that fair-mindedness rather than prejudice is desirable. Why not just call out prejudice as undesirable at that time? So, yeah, so, so that's what most people are doing when they're talking about prejudice at the time. And he doesn't. Um, one I, I don't know exactly why, why he did that, only that he did do that. But the, he's, he's, he, maybe he's trying to be objective. That's one word that uh, we could talk about for a long time. Uh, or symmetrical, to use a more relativist term. Uh, but he's, he's, he's interested here in uh, extremity of views, but not the views themselves. So whatever he thinks, to, to give an example, one of the items is, um, I, th I think all Jews would cheat. Some Jews would cheat, no Jews would cheat. Mm -hmm. And in the context of the measure, the idea that all Jews would cheat or no, no Jews would cheat is equally unfair, is equally wrong. And it's not about what you think about the idea of, of Jews being uh, talked about as people who might cheat and the obvious wrongness or the obvious anti-Semitism. It's about the extremity of views. So he's, he's kind of drawing a line in the measure and in the formal definition of critical thinking as something which is different from uh, what people happen to believe. The problem with, with fair-mindedness rather, uh, it's not what they believe, it's the extent to which they have extreme views, the extent to which they are reluctant to listen to the views of others. So if, if we assume that uh, uh, ex the extremity of views is what um, makes them unfair, doesn't that sort of assume that uh, the middle of uh, the status quo is, is always the fairest thing that we might not, might we not live in a wildly unfair society and so an extreme view would be the fair one? Uh, well, I don't think he's not talking here about the norm necessarily, but about a kind of logical position. So if, if I'll change the score, I'm more comfortable talking insulting Scots. If we, all, all Scots uh, would cheat or no Scots would cheat. Both these positions are patently absurd. 
and, and it's obviously some Scots and some English people and, and, and any category of folk, there'll be some people who would cheat and there'll be some examples of something. So the, the issue here is, is with, I can, the, the absurd, uh, with this item, is with the absurdity of having an extreme position of any kind, when in the real world, of course, uh, people are people and they're messy. Right, right. So at the time, there seems to be this growing sense, at least in America, that um, the public was vulnerable to propaganda um, and that people had to be provided with sort of cognitive means to protect themselves from those who would attempt to exploit them, whether um, political activists like the dreaded communists or just the advertisers of commercial products like uh, Freud's American nephew, Edward Bernays, who's active at that time. Um, is the is the attempt to to measure and foster fair-mindedness partly an attempt or uh, uh, critical thinking partly an attempt to protect people from those kinds of, of things? Yeah, well, interesting. The, the, the shift from from fair-mindedness to critical thinking. So the, the original, just to back up on the off chance there's anyone there who hasn't read the paper yet, the 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 the, um, the original critical thinking test is 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 uh, published by Goodman Watson and Edward Glazer, and Watson has previously published a test of fair mindedness, right. and explicitly says that the test of critical thinking is based in part on his earlier test of fair mindedness. So there's a a clear link between the two, but in terms of the differences, critical thinking comes out of a context in which increasingly Americans, including American psychologists, are becoming concerned about the power of propaganda and of advertising and finding it difficult to distinguish between the two. So they know that propaganda works after the First World War. They know that advertising works. And people like Bernays, um, who is quite happy with the term propaganda uh, and public relations and so on, is making a very good living uh, persuading people to think and want differently. So when psychologists try to pin down what's the difference between propaganda and advertising, they, they have some real difficulty, except in terms of the aims or in terms of some moral judgment, which is not really an issue of measurement. So, so the context in which critical thinking uh, uh, emerges is out of a, a group set up by a number of progressive educators at Colum uh, Teachers College Columbia, um, who formed the Institute uh, of Propaganda Analysis. And this is deliberately uh, set up to inform the public and to supposedly uh, protect them from the power of propaganda. And one of their first publications is the critical thinking test. So it's, wow. it, it's a quite clear attempt to address this huge social problem. So Watson's a member of that, of that institute. And yes, was, yes. Was, was John Dewey as well? He's at Columbia at that time as well. Um, you, well, I haven't seen Dewey mentioned in the in the group. Hmm. About now we're talking. I mean, we're talking about now by 1937. So right. it's um, the, the 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 build the, the the growing concern. It starts in the twenties. Right. It may have, may well have been earlier, of course, but but uh, it's it's going to clear the twenties. But the the actual institute is founded in 1937, and then they publish the first critical thinking test. Right. Uh, but then this, the Americans uh, eventually enter the Second World War, and now criticisms of propaganda are not deemed appropriate, and so the, the, the institute doesn't last very long. There's a shift in attitude towards propaganda for, for political yes. reasons. <laughs> sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. So we're, we're talking about uh, also the era of rapid growth in intelligence testing, Goddard's translation of the Benet Simon test had been used to identify those who were then called feeble-minded, uh, particularly, uh, most notably, uh, in the immigration centers like Ellis Island. Um, and then Terman's IQ test through the 1920s and into the 30s increasingly became the standard for school-based assessments. How was critical thinking seen as different from general intelligence? Oh, well, well there's, there's, some, there's some major differences, but I suppose that, that obviously over time, this thing we call intelligence changes rapidly too, evolves rapidly too. It becomes different things. Mm -hmm. we, we, we see it in hindsight as being uh, versions of the same thing. But of course, there's, there's the word intelligence, there's the, the, the phenomenon in the head that people have, there's the uh, link to 
mental and chronological age. There's the adult version and the army tests, the, the relationship between uh, individual performance and the norm. There's the single number and, uh, until we get to this something like what we think of as IQ now. But, mm -hmm. but in all of that, um, there's a, an assumption that it's something that you're born with there's not much you can do about it. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of social relevance, what do you do with that? And so what you get are, are uh, policies which are related to, well, there's nothing we can do about it. So perhaps we want to be careful about who we let into the country or how we educate certain people and so on and so forth. So, so for people of a more um, progressive bent, there's not a lot you can necessarily do with that, but maybe challenge the concept. Uh, critical thinking is another kind of smartness. It's a, it's a quite different kind of smartness, uh, which is something which people will differ in. There will be individual differences in terms of how much you might be born with, if it's an ability or if it's a trait. Mm -hmm. But you can learn it. You can get better at it. You can get better at it through education. And indeed, we can use critical thinking as part of education to make people smarter, to inform the citizen uh, to, to, to build a more democratic society and so on. So there's a big picture here. Uh, and and the, the way in which that's done is by the early kind of classroom experiment model. So they are comparing different classes. They're measuring critical thinking before they give one class some critical thinking classes. They measure their critical thinking afterwards. And guess what? Their critical thinking improves. So, and here's where, and this is the first time they use it in New York, they, they, they're defining critical thinking primarily as logical thinking. The critical thinking classes they get include lots of classes on logic. And after they've got classes on logic, guess what? When they do a critical thinking test, they're better at logic. And so their critical thinking has improved. So the, the, the what, the how and the why is all wrapped up together here into one neat package. Um, but but this would be another difference with with uh, between IQ. This is this is not being looked at as an individual ability. It's be, what they're actually measuring is the efficacy of a teaching right. uh, form, right. not of an individual. So 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 there's a number of ways in which it's very different from IQ. So it it, it sounds almost as though there's sort of these two parallel tracks. If you believe that there's uh, sort of an inborn ability that you can't change and that is going to be inherited from generation to generation, you go the intelligence track. And if you believe that um, there are ways in which we can improve people's ability to navigate the world intellectually, we go with critical thinking. Um, is that a way of- I said, there's, no reason, there's no reason why you couldn't do both. So they're not, they're not incompatible. But if you mean, you know, pick a psychologist and then uh, they're going to go this way or that way. I think that's, but isn't that the practice now? I mean, when I look at colleagues who do particular kinds of psychology, it seems obvious to me why they're doing that kind of psychology. You know, there, there, there's, it, it's not accidental. Um, one, one of the things in terms of, um, in terms of the more controversial end of uh, IQ, for example, is, is the issue of race and IQ. And one of the things that I've mentioned to my students uh, is before you even look at the data, you could think about why is anyone even asking this question? Where is it, where is it coming from? Okay, Because there's a clear history to that. Mm -hmm. and, and I think in that sense, there's, there's certain people would choose to ask certain questions uh, because of some broader views they have about human nature or society. And, and, and in that sense, yes, I'm quite sure there's a, an attraction to critical thinking if you believe that education is there to make people smarter rather than to um, encourage those who are already better. Right. Right. So then you come to what I take to be sort of the central conundrum of critical thinking. You say that critical thinking uh, could be measured without assuming the correctness of specific everyday beliefs, but that the measurement of critical thinking ability was always based on questions that had correct answers. So how was that dilemma addressed by psychologists of the day? So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they even trying to address it in some sense. There's a, there's a few things. So, so I suppose before that, if you think of 
if you think of uh, things like the psychology of judgment. So psychologists, early 20th century, in fact, end of 19th, are doing experiments in which people have to judge the magnitude of stimuli. And you can tell if people get it wrong because you know the actual magnitude of the stimuli. Right. Uh, but if you're going to ask someone about, uh, to make a judgment about the real world, about politics, about economics, about society, about other groups of people, well, we don't have uh, access to the actual truth on these things. Mm -hmm. So, so there's, a, there's a clear issue there. However, the relevance of critical thinking is increasingly linked to, it maybe it's there from the start actually, but certainly it becomes linked to more and more examples of uh, beliefs about the world that certain people simply think are right. So we want people to think critically, but we but we can, we are critical thinkers. We want them to think more like us, mm. and and that seems to be everywhere you look, really, from Christian fundamentalists to uh, atheist skeptics. People tend to talk about critical thinking as something which they do themselves and which others don't do enough of, right. and they're talking about their kind of thinking. So so part of the problem is that they they wanted to have that relevance. Um, but the other problem they've got is that critical thinking isn't meant to be about that. It's meant to be about how we think, not what we think. It shouldn't be based on all having the same beliefs, all coming to the same conclusions. So what you get is that kind of, um, I suppose we could just call it a middle road, but a shift towards more abstract problems and hypothetical scenarios. So that in, I don't assume that anyone who might listen to this is a psychologist, but if, if, if you want to uh, measure something in someone's head, you need to get them to do something. And you have to get them to do something in a way that you can apply numbers to, otherwise you can't measure it. So you need to give them some options, but not too many, a fixed number of options. So what you effectively get is a multiple choice uh, test. So people are asked questions and it's A, B, C, D, or E. And one of them is right. And if they get it right, then at the end of the day, it's more, it's, it's more critical thinking. Mm -hmm. How do you know it's right? Well, by creating a question which has a correct answer. Mm -hmm. So it's abstract. It's maybe uh, it's based on a syllogism or, infra, uh, or deductive reasoning or something. Um, or it is a a hypothetical scenario about Bob or Jim in the real world, but all the relevant information is packed neatly into a paragraph. Mm -hmm. and, and then you can say, well, that's, you, can, you can point to a, 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 a one answer and say, yes, that's the correct one. Right. It's Which is very different from the real world. It, it is, it's interesting that they uh, didn't come up with a method, uh, a testing method that sort of assesses the stages you go through in your thinking rather than coming to a particular answer given what they were um, um, trying to measure. I, I'm kind of reminded of like Lawrence Kohlberg's, you know, moral reasoning tests where instead of it, you just, you know, it, it's right that Heinz steals the drug or right that Heinz doesn't steal the drug. Mm -hmm. um, he measured the reasons or assessed the reasons they used for picking one or the other. And as you went through the different stages, alleged stages of moral reasoning, um, you could answer one or the other. They, you sort of oscillate through the two answers, um, but for different reasons with different justifications. But that doesn't seem to have mm -hmm. been the the, the object uh, in these critical thinking tests, at least in the 1930s and 40s, I guess. Yeah, I think that there's, there's, there's a, an issue of teaching critical thinking, which doesn't have to be number-based. And there's the measurement of critical thinking, which does have to be number-based. Mm -hmm. And it's done with groups, with, with classes and so on. And so it becomes a matter of efficiency, uh, as indeed in our department, we test all our first years with multiple choice questions. There's, there's just too many mm -hmm. to, uh, to do ourselves. Yeah, right. you know, I know it's not right. It's not the best way to assess, right. but it's efficient and it's okay given, that, given the, the role of the first year class, which makes their contribution to the degree. Right. Uh, so so there's, a, there's a sense in which, um, with, as with any measurement, you have to take something which is complex and human and messy and reduce it to something that you can count. Yeah. 
that's the process of measurement and without measurement, psychology is not a science and we can't have that. So, so, so it's an essential part of the process. And if that's the price you pay, then so be it. When you say we can't have that, I, I, I get the sense that there's a bit of wryness there that you were saying that the discipline believes you can't have that. Of course, there are people who have argued that psychology really isn't or can't be scientific and have proposed other ways of pursuing the discipline. Sorry, yeah, I, I was not being entirely serious when I said that. But what I mean is, of course, that psychology as a discipline has always defined itself as right. scientific. Paragraph one, page one, first textbook, it's always there. Right. And it means certain things. And it doesn't mean philosophy. And it doesn't mean the common sense. And it doesn't mean the pseudoscience. Right. It's different. And so the boundary work is there from the, the, the moment the student steps through the door. And, and, and so that's what I mean when I say so. So when when psychology students are learning about psychology they they are given this idea that they are able to observe the mind but of course measurement is the the lens through which they can observe the mind yeah but what the students get between the the, the stuff in the head the names that we use the formal definitions the the measurements that we use which get us data from people who are forced to do a very uh, small list of things to give us data which we can then observe, mm -hmm. the gap between the first thing and the last thing is huge. And that's where our action is in history and theory of psychology. It's in right. this mess here. And that's where the, 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 the job of the historian of psychology in a psychology department it can be really about that. It can be about how every time we see anything about anything psychological, there's there's these gaps here, right. and they are historical, and they are full of assumptions, and they change over time. And we can look at that, and that will remind us that when we see anything about intelligence or critical thinking or personality or memory or anything else, what do we mean by that? What do the data actually represent? And that that to me is where the the importance of history of psychology is right. within the psychology. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, jumping ahead a couple of decades, uh, there was this uh, U.S. National Commission on Excellence in Education in the 1980s. And it was at that time that at least the government officially acknowledged that traditional philosophical logic wasn't terribly useful in this area of critical thinking, that you didn't you could learn these these fallacies and this informal logic, but it, it didn't seem that uh, people would automatically apply it to um less artificial situations than they were given in the logic tests. Um, and they recommended instead a shift to the psychological areas of problem solving and decision making and probabilistic reasoning. Um, this sounds like a rare moment in the political sun for psychological research. W what happened there? You tell me. I mean, the, 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 there's certainly a lot of work going on in that area, more and more going on. Uh, you mentioned some earlier, you mentioned Tversky and Kahneman and the whole, the, the, what I've called before the psychology of error, which is a continual theme in, in psychology, uh, which has been going on since, really since before the discipline emerged, there's been a, a, an ongoing theme that psycho psychological scientists before the discipline and psychologists since have been making that certain beliefs are wrong, that this is a product of error, and that what you need to do to reduce this error is to be more scientific and psychological. And there's a, there's a bunch of different examples of that. And, and, and this would be the, the, the heuristics and biases. That would be another version of that. But there's a huge, huge, um, I hesitate to say market, but it's out there now, of, of psychological knowledge, which tells people uh, your, your memory is unreliable, your perception is unreliable, you can't notice a gorilla, you're, 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 you've got no sense of logic, you're, 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 you can't be trusted, you're, you're, your ears are bad, your hair's bad, if everything is bad. It, it's, uh, and, 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 but if you know more about it, you'll be better. Mm -hmm. and, and this is the nature of the critical thinking literature since the, um, well, actually since the 80s, yes, th th there's been this idea that to think better is to be more scientific. To be more scientific is to, uh, test hypotheses uh, to understand probability and to be able to list as many biases as possible uh, with the idea that there's greater awareness 
will make us uh, uh, less uncritical. And I think we've seen in recent years just how effective it's been. Um, yeah, I, being I, I, again. yeah. Um, it, it seems interesting to me that on the one hand, we say, you know, um, people don't sit around going, gosh, I think I just made the fallacy of affirming the consequent there, or I just made the fallacy of, you know, one of these, uh, you know, of, of ad hominem. Um, but we expect them instead to go, oh, gosh, I think I just fell into the availability heuristic there. Or I just fell into the representativeness heuristic. Those don't strike me as wildly different um, expectations uh, in, in yeah. mentally, cognitively, yet somehow the yeah. new ones seemed at the time more natural or, or more usable than the other, the older ones did. Well, some of them are really, they're very old and they're quite clean, they're quite simple, they're formulaic. When you get into informal logic, which comes around the same time, which is an attempt to apply logic to real world discourse, now we have a different problem. We've got lots of fallacies still, and some of them are in Latin, so we know they're true. <laughs> but how do they apply to real world discourse? And I looked at many of these and thought, I, and I've done discourse analysis, so I, 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 I read discourse differently from, I suppose, most people would. And I didn't see the fallacies that I was meant to see in these arguments. I saw other things, though. Right. Um, and it's one of the things in which, um, well, just one example. The, the old two quoque uh, fallacy, which is currently described uh, as whataboutism since the kind of Cold War days, but increasingly with, with Trump and with others, uh, we'd have this uh, daily event of a spokesperson answering a question with, so you did this, and them saying, but what about them? They did it too. Mm -hmm. Now that's a logical fallacy in the sense that uh, it doesn't answer the question. It's a deflection and so on. Um, but it works, it still works. And it works because actually, it doesn't matter that it's illogical. What they're getting at is an issue of hypocrisy. And, and if, if you say to me, I did this thing, and I say, but you did this thing, it's a fair point. Mm -hmm. So in the real world, that's, I wouldn't call that a fallacy at all. It, it, it's a reasonable point. It's only a fallacy in very specific, uh, a very specific logical context. And so part of the problem of informal logic was just that, that it, it, it's not so easy. You can, you can label kinds of discourse, kinds of arguments in different ways, but to say that they actually are that or that that's all that they are is, is deeply problematic. We seem to be uh, uh, discussing a sort of a distinction between logic on the one hand and rhetoric on the other hand. We, we often dismiss rhetoric as being somehow illegitimate, yet we use it all the time. And this is a situation where it's rhetorically effective, even if it's technically logically fallacious. Yes, and, and within philosophy, rhetoric's been seen as a bad thing for a very long time, but it isn't, in, in my world it's not. If you, if you know Mick Billig, if you know the, the discourse analysis folk, rhetoric is something we all do all the time, including scientists. Uh, ev there's a sense in which everything we say is rhetorical, um, and that would be a good target for critical thinking. Mm -hmm. But there is a real danger, as there is with bias, of saying, there's rhetoric is bad, we shouldn't do it. Because you then have to say, well, show me something which isn't rhetorical. Exactly. And I don't know what you'd show me at that point. So, so it, it, it's, it's in that sense, like bias, it's, it's, a, it's a shaky foundation. You know, in many of these interviews, I find that we end up in a discussion of the rhetoric of science, I guess we'd call it, that we, you know, we have certain, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, pat argumentative strategies like null hypothesis testing, for instance, or ways of arguing uh, uh, that we all accept, we all sort of have to sit back and go, oh, yes, that's true. But they, they're, they're rhetorical strategies more than they are logical or statistical or probabilistic or mathematical or formally theoretical uh, strategies. They're just effective within the, within the, the, the scheme of science, within the, the, the context of science. Um, but when you try to explain them to people outside of that, they, they aren't nearly as effective because they haven't been trained in the same way. No, but they'll take, this is why the label of science is so important. So, so the, 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 within, you know, within this, if we take psychology, uh, which is a 
you know, a, a particular science, and, and some would argue it's not a science. But if we assume for a moment, for the vast majority of psychologists, it is a science. Mm -hmm. And what they mean by that, there's a general agreement on that. It's not universal, but it's pretty widespread. Then they, they would say, well, yes, we have a shorthand. When we say this, we understand. We understand that we're making this assumption and this assumption and this assumption. We understand it's a sample and it's representative according to this and the p-value is this number, it might be other. We understand all that. Right. It's just a shorthand. And that's all fine as long as everyone knows the rules. But then psychologists leave that world and go outside the door into the real world where people don't know the rules. And then they start talking about objectivity and facts. And this is where the label of science really matters, right. um, because the public don't know that. They think of science as being something else. And they do think of things uh, such as objectivity and experiments and, and whatever they think of that, they, they think it's simpler than what it really is. Well, yes, I noticed, I mean, especially during the pandemic, I noticed that people seem to... Um, become upset when the scientists change their mind. We have this brand new disease and we're just developing treatments for it. And, you know, every three or four weeks, uh, the recommendations change and, and people go up on arms and say, oh, but you, so you didn't know what you were talking about in the first place. And you know, no, no, that's exactly how science works, especially in a, in the situation of a, of a new phenomenon that we haven't quite worked out yet. Yes, exactly. And, and it makes you wonder, uh, because a lot of people and a lot of money spent on, um, uh, of public understanding of science and the promotion of this. There's scientific celebrities in Britain and, and, and in, in uh, North America as well. And um, I, I hear them every now and again, and, I, and some of them you think, yeah, that's, that, that's fair enough. But, but there seems to be this issue of who it is they're meant to be arguing with. So when, you, when you're arguing with what we call religion, when there's science versus religion, and religion has got certainty and science, well, science starts to play the certainty game. Right. They know they can't really do it, but the rhetoric starts to get pretty close. And, and then of course, when they change their minds and you've been arguing against religion all the time, that looks shaky. Mm -hmm. When it's political, changing your mind, that looks shaky. Mm -hmm. you, shouldn't, you shouldn't be changing your mind. That's sense, you've got no sense of conviction. And as you say, of course, but that's the point. That's yep. the point. It's meant to yes. be data driven. Um, someone, someone needs to do a better job on that, I think, and it would start with with some more honesty about precisely what what science is. Well, there's and discomfort, think, well, this discomfort with uncertainty, this public discomfort with uncertainty, yeah. and even among scientists. I mean, scientists want to be certain. Many of them, you know, act as though they're more certain than they really are. I think because there's a discomfort with the fact that. I can call it a fact that we are almost always dealing with uncertainty and and yeah I, I was teaching a class just a few weeks ago uh a fourth year this is final final year so they've had they're almost at the end of their honors degree at Edinburgh now and I I, I gave them one which is it was really about objectivity but it became really about uncertainty um and uh, it, it, I, it went on longer than it normally does because they were really worried no, no one, somehow in four years, no one had told them this. <laughs> and, and, and it all started from somebody using the word proof. I right. Think. Because some of my colleagues will still use the word proof. Yeah, I hear and it. Object, and, and again, they mean specific things in a certain context by that. But it's, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's also, when you see the, the way that, that we we'll call it scientific psychology interacts with applied psychology, and, and how that's, um, at least around here, it may be different in North America, that there's, there's a chasm between the two. Uh, for, for quite good reason, there's a, there's a chasm between the two. Right. Uh, and and I, I don't know the extent to which a degree in what we'll call academic or scientific psychology is genuinely useful if you want to be in what we also call applied psychology, because of course it's not really applied psychology. It's it's a different thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think that many people, when they start university, expect that after four years they're going to know something that they didn't know before, not just understand their doubts better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, the thing I've been trying to do recently is is, is 
it's trying to give the students something they can use. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've, I've found that to do that, I've had to ignore almost all of academia and, <laughs> and come up with something myself, which I'm very confident is solid, but it, it's, it's barely academic, but it, I, I do think it's practically useful. So um, I, mean, I, I, I mentioned to you before, I, I created a critical thinking course and to make it work, I had to make it a zero credit course. Otherwise, I'd have to follow a whole different set of rules and it would become precisely what I, I think is wrong with critical thinking. So I, I made it zero credit. It was entirely voluntary. Um, and I made it all about curiosity. And guess what? People find curiosity interesting. Who'd have thought? So uh, that, that, that worked really well, but that then became a much more kind of common sense um, approach. So, so talk I'm, about I'm very comfortable. Talk about how oh, you yeah. do that course. How do you teach curiosity or how do you foster curiosity as a course? Yeah, well, this is where the zero credits are useful because because to have if I had credits, I'd have to test them in some way. And I and I don't, I've thought about this and maybe someone out there has got, got a better idea. I can't think of one uh, of how you would actually measure curiosity in a meaningful way. I know some people have tried, but I, you know, the fact that you can measure something doesn't make it real. And the fact that uh, something is matters um, doesn't mean it needs to be measured. So, so whilst I realize that politically it'd be useful if I could measure people's curiosity before and after and show that my course increases curiosity, mm -hmm. I know that would be a con. Mm -hmm. What I can do though, is stand in front of students and, and say interesting things. And, and that's where you, you've got to think about what's, what's the thing I want to get across here. And so I just thought about a number of themes that matter and then broke them down into, into what I, I use the word curious all the time um, because it saved me having to think of a new word. But, but basically there would be a lecture on what we see and what we miss, a lecture on what we believe and what we don't, a lecture on what we want. And then there'd be a, a other lectures on different kinds of critical thinking, and then a very practical, how to think critically about any knowledge claim, which I came up with. Can you expand um, on one of those? Like what, when you say what we see and what we miss, what do you have in mind? So, so, so that came down to, in, in, so I've been teaching for a while, not as long as you, but for a while. Uh, so I thought, well, what, what do I know students like? So, so what, what you, it starts with what you think depends on what you notice. It starts with what you see and hear, uh, but you only see a fraction of what's out there. And then I do a bit in psychology of magic, which is about 20 minutes. Okay. But it's, it's, it's I've done that stuff for years and the whole thing is based on a yellow ball. So there's no slides, there's no notes, there's no laptops. All the students have to put the laptops away, switch their phones off. I'm just talking to them now. Mm -hmm. And I do 20 minutes on, on misdirection in magic, which explains how misdirection works and demonstrates how it works at the same time. So they experience exactly what I'm talking about. That's what it's designed to do, okay? Uh, and I know that works because people who've seen that talk come up 20 years later not all of them, but some of them. I said, "Oh, you gave that talk." So I, I, I know that sticks in the head, and it's right. like, so I want to get across that. That's one point about how much we can miss. Right. Um, so, so I should tell our viewers at this point that you have been a professional magician, and so you can do these things in front of class in a way that. I, yeah, I used not. to be a magician. I'm all, I'm all right now. But I, I, I used, to, I, I, I put myself through university doing that. Right. And that's how I ended up in a psychology department. Um, and when it comes to talking about very psychological things like attention, um, I know there's all sorts of experimental work, but to this day, I've not seen anything that is any more useful than mm -hmm. what magicians have been doing for you know a couple of millennia. Right. Well, a good deal more than that, but in terms of misdirection specifically, at least since the 1870s. Um, all, all the stuff that we now call change of blindness, inattentional blindness, um, to me, I, you know, I know how to do that walking into a real room and they right. don't they can make videos, but and I, any, any decent magician can, can do that. So, so I don't care much about the jargon 
because what I want to teach here is the general points and the right. awareness. So can you give perhaps um, one of the other uh, examples would um, help people who are, I mean, there are a lot of teachers who are watching, I think, and, and would like to know, you know, some tips about teaching curiosity, teaching critical thinking in this way. So if you're not a magician and you can't demonstrate this stuff for people live in class, uh, I think the other one was what people believe and what they and what they don't was that after yeah so so well one thing i'm i i tend to focus on the stuff i know well because you can really do critical thinking about anything mm -hmm. and i i just think about the stuff that uh i know works it becomes much, this was also based on live teaching so if, if folk are thinking how, how do i teach this stuff i i, I don't know exactly because i was thinking how how do i get people to sit forward in their seats mm -hmm. I've, I've you know i've given them i don't know thousands of lectures and talks and to, to all kinds of different people and i've performed professionally and so on so i so i know i have some skills which are handy and i use them other people have other skills and they can use them if i could make a good video i'd make a good video but i'm really bad at that <laughs> i'm good at live stuff uh i'm not so good with the online stuff but um, I know how to stand in front of an audience and keep their attention because mm -hmm. that's just the basics. You, you can't perform unless you can do that. Right. And then it's about narrative. So, so, so I came up with stories, some of them kind of curious bits of history. Um, some of it's based on research I'd done. So I did a book on the Indian rope trick, for example, which is an exemplar of, of weird interpretation. But again, I did that because I know that and I know how to use it. Um, the belief stuff, I've written a lot about extraordinary beliefs. So I used uh, I, I, I used a bit on extraordinary belief that begins by what seems like debunking spiritualism mm -hmm. and gets the, audi the audience, well, this was the audience, the, 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 the students to a point where, yes, isn't this silly? So in that sense, it's, it's very typical of what psychologists do with these things. And then I turn it around and start to make it sound very plausible indeed, which to me is the proper critical thinking thing. You, you need right. to, you need to uh, not reinforce what they believe, but to challenge what they believe. So you take them through this until you've destroyed, apparently destroyed spiritualism, and then say, then again, what they would have argued is this: you only need to have one miracle for miracles to be possible. You only have to have one phenomenon. This is William James's mm -hmm. micro argument, okay? Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do we know there isn't one out there? And then I give an example of the one thing that I'm, I can't quite explain and, and nobody else has explained and say, and now they're not so sure. And then I, then I just leave them with that. And then for a week, they have to go away with that. <laughs> Uh, but I, I don't know. I mean, that's not really much help, though. Um, I, I think that I think that. So the, the, I'm thinking of stuff that might be better known. So the lecture on what we want. I talk about propaganda and advertising, and there's loads of great stuff. Uh, lots of old adverts which are funny, which are weird, which are misogynistic, and you can do stuff with that. You know, this, the, the the fact that these things were normal then, but now students find them offensive. You can do stuff with that now. Right. You, can, you can make this explicit. Um, and, I'm, yeah, and, and, and I'm trying to think of, if I can think of anything I can send you, if anybody wants, then I'll, I'll do that. I'm, I'm actually working on a book right now, but I've not finished it yet, so I can't send you that. But um, the, the key thing is, I suppose, in order for crit critical thinking to matter, it's something that has to be done. Right. It's not a set of rules that you give people so they, so they know the names of things. They have to do it. And that has to begin with curiosity. So you begin with that. And once you get them curious about something, you then let them in. And that's in line with all the kind of curiosity literature. You need to, um, you know, create a, a knowledge gap. It reminds me of, of, the, of the situation with a lot of practical skills where I can teach you how to, or sorry, I can teach you about I don't know, playing 
football or playing baseball or driving or, you know, some skill like that, but you won't be able to do it because of the rules that I've given you. You'll have sort of a, a general understanding of how it operates, but it's only when you practice it that you actually gain the skill. And it sounds like you're saying that critical thinking is not something I can just give you a list of rules about, and then you will be a critical thinker, but you have to have um, substantial practice in, in being a critical thinker in, in situations where you really might doubt um, in order for you to become proficient in it. Yeah, so, so one thing I did to try and, to try and do that, and, and that there might be a video online about this, was to create, uh, it was called the original psychic challenge. It was based on this event which I can't quite explain. And, I, and it's, 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 one, it's one of those things that I probably know as, as much about as anyone in the world, because I have really studied this thing mm -hmm. and I can't explain it, which is why I studied it. And I got to the conclusion that I actually don't know what happened here. So I recreated it in the basement of the department and I got students along and gave them all the relevant information and said, it's your job to solve the mystery. And if you solve the mystery, you'll get a prize. I forget the prize, but I knew no one was going to solve it. Yeah. And, that, and that was the job. Now, of course, nobody solved the mystery, but that, that in a sense was the teaching point. That was the learning objective, which was, uh, it was, it was an event where apparently uh, something levitated in the air and no one's been able to explain how it was done. And the, the, it was an experiment, Victorian experiment, someone's house, uh, by William Crookes, and he wrote a paper on it, and he called the phenomenon that happened psychic. So this is the original psychic phenomenon. So I recreated that in the basement, and then people tried to solve the mystery. And the point of it was, so if you can't solve that mystery, do you then believe in psychic phenomena? Right. And if you don't, why not? And that's their dilemma. And, and, and if they're curious at all, they'll think that one through. Mm -hmm. so, so any kind of unsolved mystery might work, I suppose. But, but the reason for that was to take something which I knew, if you want people to say that they don't believe, it's, it's, it's very, very easy to do that in almost any world. You can get people to publicly put their hand up and say, no, I think that's nonsense. If, if you, I don't know if you could, you probably can't do it in your world, but one thing I did informally was uh, I got everyone to agree, put their hand up if they did not believe that Satan was real. And then I read out a genuine satanic, I say genuine satanic, I mean, I read a, 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 an apparently genuine satanic uh, a verse, mm -hmm. which was an incantation to call up Beelzebub, and, and just to see what they'd do. But I, I don't think I'd do that in the university, yeah. but but in terms of making people think about the nature of belief, that they say, no, I don't believe in Satan. Well, then, would you be happy for me to call him up right now? And now let's just see how strong is your belief. There, there, are, there are things that you can do. I'm not sure what universities would make of them. So, so, so was, the, uh, was your experience that uh, people began to get uneasy as you, as you spoke the incantation, even though they had declared that they didn't believe it? Or... Well, that's what I expected, right? I did it twice in two different contexts. The first one, uh, I, what, the way I set it up was, uh, all your hands are up. Uh, if you want me to stop, just lower your hand. But if there's a single hand up, I'm going to get to the end, and that's when it all, it's all meant to happen, okay? And, I, and, and at that occasion, a lot of hands dropped. But I also did that because I knew hands will naturally drop because it's just quite, you know, Right. You put your hand up, you, you don't naturally keep it up. Um, and so I saw a little bit of, 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 uh, of unsettled behavior. The second time, nobody cared because I'd, I'd, I'd done a joke before. I'm not going to repeat the joke, but I did a joke beforehand, All right. which made the thing look too silly. So there's a, there's a definite walk here. Um, but I, and that's, you know, that's not really much use to... <laughs> To anyone teaching, no, I think uh, the, I think there's a, 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 a an array of, of of tips there, of hints, and people can uh, find the thing that they're most comfortable with and and go from there. And anything that they find genuinely interesting and and they can convey that to students is is, is the way to go, and that will that will vary, of course. I suppose. Right.
So um, finally, um, I've been asking most of the people I interview a bit about their own uh, personal and professional backgrounds. And uh, what I've been finding is that a um, few of them ran straight from, in a straight line from kindergarten to their university positions. Um, everyone's path is crooked in some way, um, but yours may be a little more crooked than most. Um, would you please tell us a bit about your background? So I, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm what they call now first generation. Um, I, so my parents didn't go to, you call it there. First gen. There? First gen, you know, okay, that, that saves time, doesn't it? Okay, I'm, I'm first gen, I'm 1G. Um, I used to work at British Rail. I got bored, I went traveling, I decided to be a school teacher. That's why I went to university to become a school teacher. Just like teaching uh, was what mattered to me. And then I had to work as a magician to put my cigar, I didn't get any money. So I had to sell my flat, which I'd bought when I was working and then started to work as a magician. At the end of it all, I, I was qualified to become a school a history teacher in a state school in Scotland. And the same week I was offered a job, a friend of mine who I knew from the magic circle offered me a job to work on the psychology of magic. And that just seemed too obviously good to turn down. So I, so I did that and that's how I ended up in a psychology department. And that's when I um, so I, I'd studied history at university. I never studied psychology. I'd studied history, and like when I went to diplomatic history, uh, it was a social and economic, social and economic history. Yeah. So I, I I found myself in a psychology department, and I was a, I was a researcher, short term contracts for years, for ten years. Uh, did my PhD at the same time, which was also in it was in Victorian spiritualism. That's where I started off, and. Uh, and then the guy who was in charge of the unit, which was a, a parapsychology unit, uh, he died. And the money they had to study parapsychology, they changed into a couple of jobs. I went for one of the jobs. And in order to get one of those, is this too much detail? So no, no, go ahead. I'm, I'm, this is, I'm trying to keep it brief. Uh, a job came up for us, a, 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 a temporary lectureship in psychology with a specialism in parapsychology. And I could, I could be that because that's, I'd worked in, I'd never done what they call the Psi Hypothesis, but I'd done what they call the Pseudo Psi Hypothesis in this history and sociology of the paranormal, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I got that job. And then I found myself as a lecturer in psychology who'd never studied psychology. And, and then a colleague of mine said to me, oh, but you're a historian, why don't you teach history of psychology? And I said, is that a thing? <laughs> and that's when I found out about people like you and, and um, Graham Richards and uh, Adam Coll uh, Alan, Alan Collins and Jeff Bunn, Peter Hegarty in Britain and, and so on, and found the work of uh, Kurt Danziger in particular, who was hugely, hugely helpful, mm -hmm. uh, and Roger Smith and Ian Hacking and all these, all these big names. And thought, oh, this is interesting, and I can do this. And then the job was how to teach history of psychology to psychology students in a psychology department, which is, which is not as common as it might feel to you because you're in the one of two weird places in the world where that's relatively normal. But, but we know there's usually only one person who teaches history of psychology in most psychology departments, if that, so. Yeah, and, and that's all I was doing. I don't do anything else. So right. I had to find a way to do that. And, and so, and the reason I mention all that is that the, the that everything I've done, teaching and research, has, has been from that position of how can I teach history of psychology or history and theory of psychology uh, to psychology students so that everyone thinks it's psychology. And that's why uh, historical psychology, or this sort of Danziger type uh, of psychology, is so useful because you can take anything that they study and say, okay, but what are we actually talking about here? What do you mean by that? Are you sure? Mm -hmm. Didn't mean that before. It meant this. Mm -hmm. And now you can start to deconstruct, although you're trying to avoid language like that if you can, but you can start to deconstruct these things and, and start to get at all these uh, things, which I've, for many years, I've called critical thinking. So mm -hmm. critical history, critical psychology, I know those are the things, but when you work alone in a psychology department, critical history, critical psychology, that doesn't work. 
but everyone thinks critical thinking is a good thing. Right. So you can, you can basically frame that as good scientific thinking. And there's enough people there who agree with you. There's yeah. enough, not, not everyone's an idiot. There are, there are psychologists who fully understand all these assumptions and the value in them in their students learning it. So it's, it's all been about that, um, finding ways to start with what psychology students know uh, and, and, and then using that as a, all, all, all teaching of history, you've got to start with what students know, otherwise it's, it's painful. You've got to start with something. With the, if you live in Edinburgh, there's plenty of things to point at. Mm-hmm. You see that building, you see that statue. Do you know who that is? I'll tell you. And, and now you're in, and now, now the, the street's more interesting, the building's more interesting, they live in a more interesting world. So right. there's lots of ways to do that. Uh, with psychology, that's what I'm trying to do is, is, is start with the thing they've been studying for, you know, for two weeks or a year and say, okay, but what, what actually is that? Right. And is, you know, what's, what is memory then? You've, been, you, you've done a dissertation of memory. What's memory? Okay, so I, when I go, sorry, I'm just going to get a, go. No, 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 that's fine. Um, I was just going to say, I think that's a real, the reason I had you uh, go on about that story, I, I think that um, uh, a lot of students, uh, a lot of people who have just graduated with their PhDs and are trying to get, you know, uh, you know, make a living being an academic, uh, we have in our minds that there's sort of this one way in which it happens that you, you know, do a dissertation and publish a couple of papers and then you get a job and then you get mm-hmm. tenure and then you retire. Um, um, but there's a hundred different ways to become an academic and everybody has the, their different story and, 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 and yours is, a, is an interesting one, an unusual one. And I think uh, tell, shows people that there's, there are other ways than, than the, the sort of standard image to, to make your way in the academic world. I, I think most of the interesting people I've met have not gone that normal route. They bring something else to the table. You know, the, 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 there's, there are some people who seem to go this this sort of typical route and never work in the real world and never engage with other people and perhaps perhaps that allows them to have more faith in some of the claims that psychologists make if you've never actually worked in the real world and seen what people are like uh, but I, I do think there's a there's a, a huge value of people who are older people who d- our parents didn't go to university but they did uh, I think that working while you're studying is fine if you're lucky enough to have the opportunity and, and, and a, a way of earning that doesn't take up all your time. Um, the, the motivation is, again, in my own experience and everyone I've known over the years, uh, mature students are far more motivated. They, they know what the role's like and they realize how lucky they are to have the opportunity to be at a university. And not all 18 year olds do realize that? No, I, um, I think that's absolutely true. There, are, I mean, there are many eighteen-year-olds who are in university um, because they belong there. But I think there are some who, I think there are many who who uh, kind of fall into university out of high school because that is the next thing that they're supposed to do, and that's what their parents say, and that's what their friends say. Um, but there are no mature students who fell into university. They all stopped doing something else that they were doing and made a decision that they were going back to school, and uh, they have a um, I don't want to say more, but a different kind of commitment to that education um, than someone who's younger and has never done anything but be in school. Yes, I think I think that's, I think it's absolutely true. And um, it well, there's many things we could talk about in terms of higher education. Uh, probably not one the, the recording buttons on, but um, yeah, I, I I do think that increasingly, and I don't know if this is of any value to anyone, but. Uh, increasingly, I care less and less about the content of what we teach. So I, I really, I'd be very happy to work in a history department or if I knew enough uh, philosophy department and anthropology, I've got no interest in the, the content because in terms of why it matters, once you go into the world, it's, it's just not about that. It won't mm-hmm. matter. Certain statistical techniques, I know you teach that, that will be useful. Um, but then you come back to, so what, what are the genetic skills that matter? And that's when you start to pick up phrases like critical thinking mm-hmm. as, as a kind of umbrella term for those interdisciplinary or at least not, not discipline specific uh, kinds of thinking that might be useful. Right. Well, that's a really good place to wrap it up, I think. Thanks so much for being with us. Well, thanks for having me and um, see you soon.
So that's all for this episode of the History of Psychology Show. I hope you enjoyed the interview, and I'd like to thank Peter Lamont one more time for spending some time with us. The summer is upon us, and uh, people are beginning to have other things to do, especially with the circulation of the vaccine and the restrictions beginning to be lifted from our lives. Um, so uh, this may be my last episode for a while. Um, I have one more interview planned. I'll probably drop that sometime in the early summer. And then I'm going to take a break until the fall, perhaps, um, when I hope we'll get started again with the History of Psychology show. See you then. Thank you.